So thank you, Nathan. Uh, this is joint work with Orsatat, and uh, this work is about how to prepare ground states of certain Hamiltonians. And uh, it will rely on a beautiful tool called the quantum Loas local lemma. So we are interested in preparing ground states of Hamiltonians, aren't we? Like quantum chemistry and a lot of uh, research is going into this, this direction. In particular, uh, into the direction of uh, local Hamiltonians, because in many body uh, quantum physics, this is a natural assumption. So I will talk about uh, local Hamiltonians in a bit more generic uh, uh, manner, meaning uh, that my Hamiltonian is sum of local terms where each local term acts on k qubits or qubits. Uh, but they no, don't need to be arranged in a spatial manner. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I will, I will talk about qubits, but all the world generalizes to qubits as well. So these local Hamiltonians can, can have very interesting ground state, uh, state structures. And one interesting property is frustration freeness, which means that uh, there is a so-called frustration free state, which minimizes the energy of all local terms uh, simultaneously. Uh, so this is a very special form for ground state. And there are lots of examples. For example, the Kitaev story code is frustration free. So <clears throat> how generalizes this problem? Well, it turns out that we can reduce uh, our Hamiltonians to a simplified version where we replace each local Hamiltonian term by a projector, which is a projector to the excited uh, states. And uh, it turns out that this projector reduction carries over the frustration-free property and also the frustration-free states remain the same. Now, if, if you consider this uh, projector setting, then this leads to the uh, KQ set problem, which is the following question. Given a set of projectors, uh, which are all K local, decide whether the arising Hamiltonian is frustration-free or not. So this is actually a generalization of the classical set problem in the following way. Uh, consider a classical instance where we have clauses. Uh, each clause uh, sets some restriction on, on the Boolean variables it's talk, it, it talks about. For example, this first clause will say that x1, x2, x2, and x3 shouldn't, uh, should avoid the all zero configurations. So when I trans transform it to a, a projector term, I penalize the state, which is all zero on these qubits. Similarly, this clause tells me that I should avoid one, zero, one on these bits, uh, which uh, translates to a penalty uh, projector, which is one, zero, one in these states. And it's easy to see whenever uh, this, uh, the arising uh, system is frustration free, and it's exactly the uh, corresponds to the satisfiable instances classically. So how hard is it to uh, decide frustration freeness? Well, similarly to, to the classical case, a two set and two Q set are actually quite easy. They are all in classical polynomial time, solvable, which was uh, in the classical case shown by Brauwe in 2006. There is a very sharp transition because three set is NP complete and similarly, Three Q set is QMA one complete, and uh, this is work uh, followed by uh, this is work of Kitaev followed by Gosset and Nagai who strengthened uh, the statement to this form. Uh, so it's very hard to decide whether my Hamiltonian is frustration free, let alone preparing such a state. But there is a sufficient condition known as the Loas local lemma, which in the classical case guarantees that the, my set problem is satisfiable. And it was generalized to the quantum setting by Ambinis et al. And uh, it translates to a sufficient condition for KQ set to be frustration free. Okay, so how does this statement look precisely? Uh, so suppose I have M closes. This is a classical set instance, each acting on K Boolean uh, variables. And uh, suppose that they are kind of not too dense, meaning that each clause can share variables with at most d others. These are called neighbors. So if p d e is less than one, then this instance is satisfiable, where p 
refers to the probability. This uh, whole technique comes from the probabilistic method in combinatorics. So P is just the ratio of bad, uh, bad uh, <coughs> assignments divided by all possible assignments. Well, uh, close acts on K uh, variables, so it has two to the K possible assignments, and there is only one bad assignment, so the probability will be one over two to the K. That's, that's why I call it P. And it's similar in the, in the quantum case. Uh, so I have, suppose I have M projectors, each K local, and each uh, having rank R at most. So now what will be P? Uh, P is just the ratio of the bad subspace compared to the whole subspace. Well, it considers K qubits, so the uh, subspace of K qubits is or the space of k qubits is just two to the k dimensional, whereas uh, I, I have a penalty on an r dimensional subspace, so this p number will be just r divided by two to the k. And the d is uh, similarly defined as the number of, the maximum number of neighbors of a projector, where two projectors are neighbors if they share a qubit. And the same uh, condition applies if p d is less than or equal to one, then the system is frustration free. So this was proven by Ambainis et al. Uh, and I want to show you a small example, like uh, how, how you should think about this thing intuitively. So suppose I have now uh, 16 qubits arranged in a spatial manner. And suppose I have a projector which uh, gives some penalty for some states on the first four qubits. Well, now this system is probably frustration free. But what if I add a lot of constraints? Well, this is just uh, too interdependent. I don't know, I, I probably cannot find a, a, a frustration free state in, under these constraints. Okay, so consider the other case when I have very high rank projectors. Well, then already a few projector can uh, cause me headaches. So if, if these uh, projectors are too heavy, meaning that they are too high rank, then I am in the bad shape. But the Lovas Lokalama tells me that if my projectors are kind of sparsely arranged and uh, they are not too high rank, then I can always satisfy the, uh, the formula which translates to uh, uh, that the system is frustration free in the quantum setting. Okay, so I want to give an overview of the related results. So the original Lovas Lokalama from 75 was an existential result coming from combinatorics and particularly uh, the probabilistic method. So this idea was later generalized uh, to the best possible bound by Shearer. Uh, these were all existential results. It didn't give any algorithmic means to get uh, a good satisfying assignment of a set formula. Until uh, 2009, where a breakthrough algorithm by Moser and Tardos gave us a very simple way to find uh, these assignments efficiently. And this result was pushed forward to the best bound by Kolipaka and Segedi in 2012. Uh, so what about the quantum case? Uh, as I said, Ambainis proved the existential result in 2009, and it was uh, uh, lifted to the general case by uh, Satat et al. In just last year. Now, but what about finding a ground state? This is my talk about. So. Schwartz et al. and Arad et al. in 2013 showed how to do it uh, under the original Lovas condition, but only for non-commutative projectors. So what's remaining? Pushing it to the best bound and also find a way for non-commutative projectors. After all, quantum mo mechanics is non-commutative non in general. And this is exactly my talk about. So we fill in this last case under some natural assumption on the gap. Okay, so how to find a uh, happy state classically? Well, this is the mozart tardos algorithm, which is actually fairly simple. We, we just initialize all uh, variables uh, randomly, and then fix all closes. Well, this is very simple, but how to fix the close? Well, we should check, uh, first check whether the close is right. If it's, if, it's, if it's happy, the close is happy, meaning that it's satisfied that I don't have to do anything, but if it's unhappy, then I will need to fix it somehow, so I will resample its variables 
uniformly at random. Well, in this case, I might make the other adjacent clauses unhappy, so I need to fix them if they were unhappy. Okay, so how does it work in pictures? So suppose that I have four uh, Boolean variables. Now I assign to them random values, and I check my first clause, and I find it happy. Okay, good, so far so good. I check the second uh, clause, suppose it was also happy. Now, I want to check my last close, but it turns out that it's not happy. So what can I do? I will resample the qubit, uh, the, 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 the Boolean variables. Now they are new random samples, but it, it might have happened that this close is now unhappy, so I need to check that again. But anyway, after resampling, I made this close happy, and if I was lucky, then I found that this, this, this was still happy, so I can uh, stop my algorithm and I found satisfying assignment for these three clauses. Okay, so this is the classical mozart radosh algorithm, but what can I do in the quantum case? It turns out that everything just, lit just literally translates. Uh, I only need to return, uh, I only need to replace the clauses by projectors, uh, Boolean variables by qubits, and checking whether a clause is happy or not by measuring the clause, uh, the projector. Okay. So why does this algorithm work? It's kind of uh, intuitive that whenever this procedure halts, it gives me back a happy state. But why does it stop? So our key lemma, which is actually a simplified analysis of the previous case, the, the, the commutative version as well, that uh, if I see a particular sequence of unhappy clauses and I resample them, this is what I call a resample sequence, so if I have to resample L closes or, or L projectors, then this, this particular resample sequence has probability less than P to the L, which was the length of this sequence. Well, how many such uh, bad uh, sequences exist? This is just a simple combinatorial argument. We can show that the, the number of length 3M uh, resample sec sequences is much less than E times D to the 3M. Uh, remember, M was the number of projectors or constraints. So by the union bound, it's easy to see that uh, the, the probability of seeing any length 3M resample sequence is less than PD to the 3M. It's actually much less. So under the condition that this number is less than 1, I, I can conclude that with high probability, I perform less than 3M resamplings. Therefore, I must terminate before. Okay, so how to find happiness in the quantum case? Well, this is uh, much more difficult, unfortunately. It's hard to define uh, what is a happy cat, for example, but we will get to it. So what's the main problem in the non-commutative case? Suppose I want to run the, f uh, the previous algorithm. I check the first projector, it was happy, so far so good. Now I measure the second projector, it was happy, so far so good, but since these two projectors were not commuting, it might have been the case that just by measuring this projector, this has become unhappy. So I cannot make progress. So we need to change the algorithm, but it turns out that it's enough to change only at a few locations. Namely, I need to change somehow this measurement uh, step. And if I do it in a way that I preserve my key lemma, then the whole analysis go through. So for the rest of my talk, I will just show you how to do a generalized measurement which kind of, which, which works together with key lemma. So uh, for this, I need to uh, define a, a perfect ground space projection, uh, where, and, and also F, which is a set of already fixed projectors. So suppose I have some projectors already fixed, I want to know if they are still happy all jointly, and therefore I introduce this projector pi f, for which the kernel is the same as the intersection of the kernel of the, of the individual projectors, meaning that this projector is happy if all projectors are happy individually. It's actually an easy, uh, it's easy to define this uh, projector in a commuting case. It is simply 
the product of the individual projectors, but in a non-commutative non case, it's a much more complicated object. Okay, so for now, assume that I can somehow implement this, this projector. Actually, I, I will later tell you how I do it. So now I need to define my generalized measurement procedure. So the, the most important thing of, of this measurement procedure is that I don't want to make uh, projectors that were already happy, unhappy after this measurement, unless I find that uh, the i projector was uh, unhappy, then I might do something with its neighbors. I will do a resampling anyway. Uh, but the main message is that in general, I don't want to make previously happy projectors unhappy. So I want that if my measurement returns saying happy, then, uh, yeah, okay. So the starting point is that I already have some uh, happy uh, projectors in F. Now I want to test another additional projector, the i one. So suppose that this measurement operator corresponding to uh, f having f being happy and i to check returns happy, then I want that uh, all projector is happy in f including i. Okay, so this is the good case. Now the other case, when somehow i was not happy, then I explicitly want to find uh, the unhappy state. So I want that actually my state transforms to the image of this i projector, so it, it becomes explicitly unhappy. But I want to preserve the happiness of all projectors that are not adjacent to the i projector. OK, so this, these are the requirements of my key lemma. I don't want to go into the proof. It's actually quite simple, but somewhat technical. So how on earth can I do this measurement? And uh, this is what I want to explain. Actually, I will do it in multiple rounds. And one round of this measurement will be just a weak measurement. So for me, a weak measurement of the i projector will be the following. Uh, I add an ancilla qubit to my system and apply a controlled operation on this ancilla qubit, which says that if my state was happy, then it doesn't do anything to the ancilla. And if my state was unhappy, then it rotates the ancilla qubit a little bit, only a little bit. And after this procedure, uh, I measure the ancilla qubit. So for example, uh, yeah, I, I add this ancilla qubit in the zero state. So if this rotation parameter would be just theta equals 1, and it is just an x operator, so it would just flip the state of the ancilla controlled on, on the happiness of the projector. So after all, this would be just a strong measurement. But now I can uh, adapt this continuously. And, and, and make this measurement weaker by adjusting the value of theta. So the important message here <clears throat> that if I get a one outcome on the ancilla, that will reveal me a small portion of the unhappy state, unha the unhappy part of the state, uh, square root theta portion of the unhappy state. Now these states will be un unnormalized for me. Uh, but the key point is that the happy out, the zero outcome will only disturb my state a tiny bit. Actually, it will only disturb by something proportional to theta. Observe that this is square root theta. This is roughly theta over 2. And since theta is a very small number now, uh, it is much, much smaller, this disturbance. OK, and then on the next slide, I will show what's the point of this thing. First, I want to show you what happens in the case of a strong measurement. Suppose I have this state psi which is uh, already happy according to every, everybody in, in F. And suppose I want to measure the new projector pi i, uh, which is somehow non-trivial related, related to the previous projector. So if I uh, would perform a projective measurement, then my uh, state needs to project it down to these two states. This is the one outcome of the measurement, which is I find the i projector unhappy. And this is the case when I find it happy. So remember, I'm completely fine with this case when I find this projector, this, this state, unhappy. Because I can do resampling, and it all works just as in the classical case. Well, but what happens if I find this projector uh, happy, this i, then I don't do resampling. But I want to preserve happiness of all of my previous projectors. 
So, well, what can I do? I could, for example, check whether the previous, uh, whether it, it, it was, it remained happy. Well, observe that the change in the, in this post measurement state uh, compared to the original state in this case is proportional to actually the, the unhappy outcome. So if I would now measure in this happy outcome the, the old projectors, well, with quite high amplitude, I would find them unhappy. And the main message on, on this uh, slide that these two vectors are quite similar in size, in amplitude. Okay, so now this is what I will change and adjust with the weak measurements. So again, start with the same state, but now perform a weak measurement. Well, as I, as I mentioned, the weak measurement has some, some increase, some decrease in the amplitude of the unhappy outcome, but the main point is that it will disturb my, my original state in the happy outcome only a little bit. So the main message here that this vector is somewhat shorter than it was before, but this disturbance is even quadratically shorter. It's, uh, it's multiplied with this square root theta, which is a small number. So now if I would measure uh, the happiness of my old projectors, then this projection will also be small, actually quadratically smaller than before. And the main message on this slide, that this vector is much, much shorter than this vector, and actually by adjusting the value of theta, I can make this ratio arbitrarily large. Uh, so how can I use this? Now I combine this weak measurement with, uh, with uh, the quantum Zeno effect. So I will do a weak measurement, and after all weak measurement, I will just check the old projectors, and due to the quantum Zeno effect, if I do uh, 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 weak enough measurement, then this will almost surely project back my quantum state to the happy, to the happy state. So uh, during this uh, cycle, I will never encounter unhappy, uh, unhappiness in the old projectors. And this is my main point. So another question is, how many times do I need to repeat this procedure in order to, to find uh, every unhappy part of my quantum state? Well, first, I want to draw your at attention that when uh, my state was actually happy to both f and i, then this doesn't disturb my state at all. So if, some, if my state was happy to everyone, then this measurement confirms that it, was, it is happy for everyone. That's good. Okay, so now what happens if actually my state was not happy to all of the projectors in f and i? Uh, to analyze this case, I need to consider the energy gap of my Hamiltonian, of this subsystem, which is the sum of all projectors in F and I. Well, it can be shown that if I repeat uh, this, this whole procedure for T roughly 1 over gamma times 1 over theta, then I will find all unhappy states. So. 1 over gamma is the gap. This is how hard to find the unhappy states. And 1 over theta, it's needed because I made my measurements weaker so that I need to perform more measurements. So uh, this many uh, rep repetitions suffices. And uh, yeah, and also observe that since we know in advance the outcome of this uh, uh, oil project all, all, all projector happiness measurement, namely they will always be happy, I can actually uh, simulate by uh, this, this uh, binary measurement by repeatedly randomly measuring projectors from the set F. <clears throat> and it can be shown that actually uh, the, no the number of projectors divided by gamma repetitions is fine. So this uh, analysis leads me to the definition of the uniform gap, which is the minimum of the gap of all the subsystems of my local Hamiltonian, uh, meaning that I need to consider all subsets of, the, of M, my total project, my, my, my all, so all of my projectors are uh, labeled by M. I need to find all subsets and consider the gap of all such subsystems. And this will be the uniform gap, 
And my algorithm has guarantees uh, in terms of this gap. Uh, so actually, the total number of, of measurements that my algorithm uh, need in order to find the ground state is the following. This is m cubed times d over gamma squared times log squared 1 over delta, where m is the number of projectors, d is the maximum number of neighbors of a projector, gamma is the uniform gap, and, uh, and delta is the error that I allow in the, in the output state. So this is how well my output state approximates an actual ground state. And it's very nice that actually the, error, uh, the runtime in terms of the error parameter is logarithmic. The only ugly part is this, is this uniform gap. But uh, this uniform gap assumption actually appears naturally in other related algorithms, uh, for example, in matrix product states and, and related uh, uh, algorithms. Martin Schwartz and Yiming Ge have results on how to uh, approximate, how, how to compute various local ob observables and, and other related quantities in, a, in a matrix product states, and they all need this uniform gap. So it seems that it's a natural quantity uh, in this setting. OK, so now this is my concluding slide. Uh, I want to yeah, emphasize that the only quantum part in this algorithm is happening during the measurements. So uh, actually, yeah, apart from some cl classical uh, control, everything that happens is just local measurements. And therefore, actually, I only need a very little overhead in terms of quantum resources. For example, I can uh, prepare the ground state of a 50 qubit system using only 51 qubits. And this one qubit comes from the ANSILA in the weak, measure weak measurement. And actually, since we constantly use the quantum Zeno effect, this algorithm uh, seems to have some natural error correction procedure built in, which makes it a good candidate for early quantum computers. And so now I arrive to the open questions. Uh, so probably the most, uh, yeah, so one, one of the most important open question is whether I can, uh, I can say something or, or do a version of my algorithm which can prepare low energy states without any promise on the gap, because I probably don't know anything about the uniform gap in advance. And it would also be, uh, Good to find some physically motivated examples, for example, coming from spin systems, quantum chemistry, some fermionic systems, I don't know, uh, where, where the constraints of my algorithm actually are satisfied or nearly satisfied. So previous algorithm only worked in non-commutative non setting, and now we also allow to uh, enter the non-commutative world which actually broadens the possibilities by quite much. Uh, so another uh, question is whether we can use this quantum state that we, what we actually prepare in the quantum register to solve some interesting quantum uh, uh, classical problem. Or, or can, we, can we use this algorithm to show uh, quantum supremacy uh, using some more natural problem some problem that might be actually interesting on its own. So basically, these are the open questions. And thank you for your att attention. Thank you very much, Anders. Uh, any questions? Hi. Uh, can we make a continuous version of the algorithm? Here. Um, could, could one set up a continuous version, kind of coupling some dissipative term to each of the, uh, well, terms in, in, in your constraint and continuous? I mean, it, it feels a bit like that, right? You're doing a weak measurement, and it feels that a dissipative term would naturally do a weak measurement in a continuous fashion. Uh, I didn't think too much about it, but I think that this weak measurement, strong measurement procedure can probably be simulated by, by some continuous manner as well, by tuning the, the strengths. Uh, in, in a nice way. But well, I'm I not completely it, sure. It might be more natural even in an experimental setting, right, to tune your terms in a way where they continuously try to drive the systems around state. Yeah, yeah, it would be very nice. I need to have a look at it. All right. 
Next question. At the back, I believe. Yes. Um, have you thought about looking at max sat type problems, as in where you can't actually simultaneously satisfy all terms? Do you know if your algorithm would be able to approximate ground states in that case or find them? Um, yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting question. Mm, well, it's, it's very hard to run experiments with this algorithm since we don't really have a quantum computer. Uh, actually, I tried to run some simulations on liquid, and, uh, but it's, it's very hard to say anything about the scaling. But what I can tell you, that people try to use this algorithm in the classical setting, the classical mozart tarrosch algorithm, and for example, they, they, <coughs> they uh, ask the question, what happens if I run my algorithm in a regime where I don't have guarantees that it would work? And it seems that it actually works quite far beyond uh, the proven uh, bounds. So maybe, maybe it, would, it would also be good for Maxed, but I'm not aware even classically in any simulations of that form. Further questions? Um, I may be misinterpreting your first open question, but um, if we assume that FQMA is not equal to BQP, isn't the answer no? Okay, so uh, this algorithm has guarantees on the runtime when I satisfy uh, the existential version of the Loas local lemma. So in theory, it, I, I only have proven guarantees when this is satisfied. So like, this is a restricted uh, setting. So in this setting, I think it wouldn't contradict. But uh, yeah, but as I said, there is uh, evidence that this algorithm actually would work for a bit broader class of problems, but this is all heuristics only. Okay, if there, if there aren't any more questions, I'll, I'll torment you with one. Uh, so I've got a question. Um, you can often see adiabatic state preparation as an attempt to try to uh, simulate the Zeno effect without measurement. Um, you, there's also similar scaling that you end up seeing with adiabatic state preparation. So I'm curious, have you looked at the connections between the two algorithms for state prep? Yes, we were thinking about it, and it's actually <clears throat> not completely trivial about the relationship, and we still didn't uh, recover it fully, but it seems actually very different from the adiabatic evolution. Uh, in the adiabatic uh, state preparation, you actually start from a ground state, and in this evolution, your ground state space also kind of remains constant size. Whereas here, we start in an unknown state, and we kind of build up the Hamiltonian gradually, forcing it to the ground state of, uh, like forcing it to slow, low, uh, lower and lower dimensional ground states. So my initial state can be anything, and I dissipate out bad parts of it. It's, it's not like I have an easy Hamiltonian where I know that I'm in a ground state and I kind of change it gradually to end up in the right ground state. I kind of rule out bad parts of the state gradually. So it's, it's like very different. If, if I would try to interpret it as an adiabatic evolution, the problem would be that initially my ground state would probably be exponentially large and uh, at the end would be much, much smaller. So if I don't know where to start. If I would start at a random state in the ground state of an easy Hamiltonian, then with high probability I just get on the, right, on the wrong track and end up on some higher energy, energy term. So it's actually working in very different disciplines. Although, yeah, it's very similar, the scaling in the gap. That's true. All right. Well, if there's no other questions, thank, let's thank our speaker one more time.